Doctors later than usual today at 2.45. And that's because of a BBC News special now with Martin Geisler. Hello there, good afternoon, welcome to this special programme live from a sunny Holyrood in Edinburgh, home of course to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Martin Geisler. In about 20 minutes time, we'll find out who'll be the next leader of the SNP and therefore most likely by tomorrow, Scotland's new First Minister. Over the next hour, together with a panel of all the talents, we'll bring you the results and discuss what it means for the future of the UK. I'll be live at Scotland's National Rugby Stadium where tension is building ahead of the announcement of the result. The SNP are the third biggest party here at Westminster but their opponents are chipper now Nicola Sturgeon has gone. So what might today mean for the next general election? Well all of this of course was caused by Nicola Sturgeon's shock announcement just over a month ago that she intended to stand down as First Minister and the leader of the SNP. She was a formid formidable political presence, one of the UK's most successful election winning politicians with an approval rating other leaders could only dream of. During her tenure she's dealt with five different Conservative Prime Ministers. Big shoes to fill then metaphorically, if not literally. So let's have a quick look at those hoping to fill them. Humza Youssef is Scotland's 37-year-old health secretary, seen by many as the continuity candidate. He says he'll continue the socially liberal agenda Nicola Sturgeon pursued. Despite his relatively young age, he has over a decade of experience in government. At 32, Scotland's finance secretary, Kate Forbes, is the youngest candidate. She is promising change, but as a member of the Free Church of Scotland, she sparked controversy during the campaign, admitting she wouldn't have voted for equal marriage and saying that having children outside of marriage was wrong, according to her faith. Ash Regan is the outsider. She resigned her post as a junior minister in protest at the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. She's also questioned the way the party's gone about selecting its new leader, although she does now say she will accept the result. Scottish independence, she says, is her number one priority. Well, with me throughout the programme this afternoon to offer their thoughts and analysis are the polling maestro, Professor Sir John Curtis, journalist and broadcaster, Leslie Riddick, and the assistant editor of The Spectator, Isabel Hardman. Good afternoon to you all. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us. John, to you first. Mm -hmm. um, a slightly uncomfortable territory for you because you have no data to crunch at this stage. We, we genuinely don't know what's about to happen, do we? No, we don't know. But in a sense, Martin, I'm therefore in a very comfortable position because I think the one headline I can guarantee we won't have tomorrow morning is that the polls got it wrong. Um, because the truth is the polls have not said very much. We've had one poll, literally just one poll, of the people who've actually been deciding the outcome of this election, that is members of the SNP. But it was done four weeks ago. It was of 500 people, and so it wasn't that large. Uh, now, at that stage, it has to be said, Mr Yusuf was ahead according to this poll. 31% for him, 25% for Ms Forbes. Um, but a third of people then didn't know what they were going to do. So there was clearly plenty of room out for manoeuvre. Since then, the only polling we've had, and much of that has dried up during the last fortnight, has been of the general Scottish public, including, of course, SNP voters. It has painted, it has told us one very, very important thing, and that is that amongst the general public, Ms Forbes was clearly the more popular, the most popular of the candidates, but 30% would back her, 20% for Mr Yusuf, but amongst SNP voters, it was very, very much neck and neck. And in a sense, the question we're asking ourselves is, well, will SNP members be literally like SNP voters, in which case maybe it's going to be very close indeed, and it might depend on the second preferences of Ms Reagan supporters, or will SNP members actually be even further apart from the general Scottish public and therefore perhaps take Mr Yusuf over the line. OK, well, there is the stage set at Murrayfield. Uh, in about 10, 15 minutes' time, we will get the announcement there. We will find out who has one. Let's just frame this, give it a bit of perspective. Leslie Riddick, to you first. From a Scottish perspective, just how big a moment is this? Oh, well, it is huge. I mean, it's huge in, in all sorts of ways, obviously, because we've had these long periods of first Alex Salmon for eight years, then Nicola Sturgeon for eight years. Uh, Nicola was pretty much the anointed one, so in a sense, it's one long piece of continuity for 16 years, actually. Um, there's a generational change because those two stalwarts came into uh, politics 
when it was deeply unpopular to be a, in the SNP. I can remember being a broadcaster here and just uh, there was a sense of who are these people? You know, they, they were the opposition, but they were often not treated with much respect. And that's the atmosphere. They didn't need that. Uh, Alec could have been a, an oil economist and made a lot of money. Nicola could have just been a lawyer and made a lot of money. And I think the thing is, there's a lot of respect for the old guard who fought their way through a deeply difficult political experience. These folk, um, you know, naturally, as time's moved on, have come into a different environment where the SNP is the leading party in Scotland that defines everything else. Yeah, boy, did they ever cut through, Isabel. They are now the third party, as Chris Mason was saying, at Westminster. So uh, that is a bit of a springboard, a bit of a help for whoever takes over from Nicola Sturgeon. But, but whoever that is will be walking in the footsteps of these two titans of Scottish politics. How hard a job will they have to do to get recognition and acceptance and credibility in Westminster? I think it is going to be difficult and that does really help the unionist parties uh, up here and down in Westminster. So for Westminster-based Labour, for instance, they breathed a huge sigh of relief when Nicola Sturgeon announced that she was quitting because whoever takes over from her does not yet have the same clout, the same ability as Nicola Sturgeon herself has acknowledged to wind people up to the extent that you could have a poster with Humza Yousaf uh, with Keir Starmer in his uh, coat pocket, as we did uh, with Alex Salmond uh, in the past. And I think that's something that the unionist parties have been saying, well, this is great because actually we, we don't have the sort of fear of, of Labour being in hock to the SNP after the next election, uh, for instance. But I think also the circumstances in which whoever takes over uh, is taking over the party, it, it is going to be really difficult because on the one hand you've got a party that's very split over a lot of issues that it kept quiet on basically over a number of years for independence, which now seems quite far away. Uh, on the other hand, you have the record of the Scottish Government itself coming into a much sharper focus in terms of schools, in terms of the NHS, something that I think Humza Yousaf in particular will find really hard. Yeah. All that to discuss. Some might take issue on independence being far away. We'll come back on, <laughs> on all of those issues in just a minute. First, though, the announcement, as we said, is going to be made at the home of Scottish rugby at Murrayfield. It's seen some drama on the pitch over the years. Uh, this time the drama is off the pitch in a function suite in the bowels of the main stand. James Cook is there for us to bring us some of the atmosphere. James. Martin, yes, a big and really quite busy function suite here at Murrayfield at Scotland's National Rugby Stadium where the tension has been building for the past hour or so. Quite a number of party members here, family members of the candidates, supporters of the candidates and a lot of journalists, reporters, photographers as well, of course. I've spoken very briefly to both Kate Forbes and to Hamza Youssef. I haven't seen Ash Regan yet and both of them were smiling uh, and Kate Forbes told me she was looking forward to the result. Hamza Youssef said not to read too much into his broad smile uh, and now they've disappeared out of the room where they think they're going to be told the result before everybody else so they'll be uh, perhaps mastering the idea of a poker face as they're sitting at the front while the official result is read out or, or perhaps not we will see Martin uh, yeah, James, thank you very much indeed. We'll be back to you at Murrayfield very shortly for that result. Um, everybody will be looking at the faces, won't they, when they come back in and sit in the front row. You would have to be some actor to disguise either your joy or your, or your disappointment. Yes, indeed. It's obviously a very, very difficult moment for any politician when uh, you have to face the public knowing your fate, but uh, uh, waiting for the public to hear as well. Um, I mean, I think one has to say, perhaps, you know, just standing aside from the party politics, obviously one has to hope that whoever wins and whoever loses in both cases do so with good grace. It obviously has been quite a fractious campaign. I suspect certainly a lot of SNP members will be hoping that, to some degree at least, uh, uh, all parties will be willing to bury the hatchet. And that will certainly be pretty crucial for the new leader. Yeah, let's look at that. Leslie Riddick, this has been quite a campaign, hasn't it? Six weeks of intense drama, just when you thought it was cooling off, up it boiled again. Mm. Um, quite damaging for the party, how damaging for the broader independence movement do we think and how easy to heal will it be? Well, it, it has been a bruising one for, for the party and the independence movement sits on the back of the SNP, there's no question about it. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's all sorts of tensions within a party, that the size of the SNP. I mean, I think at one point it's been the third largest party in Britain, never mind the largest in Scotland. And holding that amount of disparate opinion together has only been possible with a commanding authority at the helm and the prospect of an independence referendum keeping everyone in line. So that phrase has developed, which essentially means you keep quiet about everything else. 
But as soon as you have a change of command and possibly a lower priority seeming to be given to independence, well, why would you wish for Indy? So there's been a long build-up of all sorts of different issues. Why wouldn't there be? Because it's one country and half the population wants to have a discussion about every aspect of how it's run and hasn't really been able to have it because the SNP has been such a, a tightly steered, top-down, leadership-controlled ship. So all of that is now coming to the fore. And actually, it was always going to have to at some point. Yeah, controlled in every respect and really well and tightly controlled, Isabel, by Nicola Sturgeon, except on the issue of succession. Mm. She didn't put any succession plan in place. Are you surprised by that? Yeah, and I think a lot of MPs who I talk to when I'm down in Westminster have said that it is an opportunity for them, as Leslie says, to have a, a conversation about their identity, about what they really stand for, beyond independence, but it's also been a lesson for them in the perils of focusing too closely on just one person to the extent that there's no training, no grooming of a successor, uh, for instance. You talk about, we talk about Humza Yousaf as being the, the continuity uh, candidate, but really in terms of his performance, he's, he's not really, well, either he's not allowed himself to flourish or he's not been allowed to flourish, depending on uh, who you'd like to blame for that. Yeah, depending on who you speak to, you get very different <laughs> yeah. views on, on Humza Yousaf in a, a variety of different regards. Like, let's go back down to Westminster then and hear from Chris Mason. Chris, just, just frame this for us from, from a Westminster perspective if you would. Yeah, afternoon to you. Westminster is keenly watching what is happening uh, in Scotland this afternoon uh, for the very reasons that you've been exploring in the last five or ten minutes that the SNP have risen to be a hugely important power clearly in Scotland but then also beyond because they are the third biggest party here at Westminster pretty much freezing out in particular the Labour Party as far as seats in here in Westminster is concerned uh, in Scotland and when you look at as all the parties are here now very keenly at the race towards the next general election the maths is pretty straightforward if you rewind to the last time that Labour won a general election back in 2005 they won 41 seats in Scotland they currently hold just a single one. And there is the beginnings within Labour. There was already prior to Nicola Sturgeon uh, resigning, but certainly since then there's been a sense within Labour in particular that this might be, might be, an inflection point where they can get a toehold back in uh, to Scottish politics as far as general election seats are concerned and every seat might matter to them in assembling a majority after the uh, next election. It is no coincidence that uh, in the last month since the uh, announced resignation of Nicola Sturgeon, Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, has visited Scotland four times. Pretty much every week he's been heading north of the border because he hopes may occasionally think, but certainly hopes, uh, that there is fertile political territory for Labour in Scotland now in the way that there hasn't been uh, for years. Uh, are you getting any sense down there, Chris, from the people you speak to as to who Labour and the Conservatives would rather win this afternoon? Well, uh, they are aware, I think, uh, as plenty are within the SNP, that were it to be Kate Forbes, there would be some big internal questions for, for some. There's the whole question about uh, the role of the, the, the Greens uh, in, in, assembling, uh, in assembling a majority and a government. There's the whole questions, as, as we've been exploring, around her view, uh, views on various social issues. Equally, I speak to people uh, in... Uh, the, in Labour and the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats here who look at Hamza Yousaf and say, well, look, there's a, there's a track record of his time in government at Holyrood that they think that there is plenty to go at uh, for. And also, if you, if you are seen as something of a continuity candidate from Nicola Sturgeon, then you can't argue that you are some sort of uh, significant and massive difference as a result. So people here look on agog. They're genuinely really interested, not least because, as Leslie was reflecting, because there hasn't been a leadership race in the SNP for so, so long. And obviously in the time since there has been, there's a complete change in the SNP and its membership. Uh, th there's a sense of uncertainty about precisely how, how it might go, because how on earth do you go about trying to poll a party membership that is spread 
uh, wide a, across a, a country. So a real sense of intrigue because of the uncertainty and because it hasn't happened for so long. And also, let's be frank, because postcodes like this, just like the one at Holyrood, are political to the very end of their fingertips. And so I'm just fascinated by the intrigue, the plotting, the campaigning, the personalities at the heart of all of this, and then the speculating, which we're all doing right now, let's be frank, about what it might mean for the party in question, i.e. the SNP, and indeed all of their political rivals. Yeah, everybody where you are, Agog, everybody here, even more so. Chris Mason, thank you very much indeed for now. Um, I was hearing some analysis this morning, somebody saying quite rightly, uh, this is impossible to call, not because it could be too tight, but I mean, somebody could win by a landslide. We just, we just don't know what the membership are thinking or doing. What would be really useful just now, John Curtis, is just to run us through in simple terms, if you could, the voting system, yep. because that might be quite important this okay. afternoon. Okay, this is a preferential voting system. So that is uh, uh, members of the SNP weren't simply invited to put an X against the name of one candidate. They were invited to put the candidates down in order of preference. One, two, three. If one candidate gets more than 50% of the first preferences, they will be deemed elected. However, if none of the candidates meets that threshold, then the votes for the third place candidate, whom we are expecting to be Ash Regan, will be redistributed in accordance with the second preferences expressed by that candidate's voters. So therefore it is possible that if it's narrow between uh, the top two candidates on first preferences, that the second preference of the third place candidate should be decisive. And it's perhaps worth remembering the last time that happened, it was in the last round of the Labour leadership contest in 2010, where as a result, Ed Miliband beat his brother, David Miliband. Now, whether that is a happy or an unhappy president, I'll leave others to decide but it wouldn't be the first time that the party leadership of a party has been determined by the second preferences of a defeated candidate. Adds to the drama, Leslie, but actually it's a mechanism by which you can have a winner who didn't get most of the first preference votes. It is, but, uh, but on the other hand, I think Scots are really quite used to using proportional voting systems. It's, uh, it's like everybody's recalling horror from the implications of what would happen if you do use something proportional. Nobody's suggesting now that we would go back to the old days of just putting crosses, which you've got to say is commonplace south of the border and good enough, although I think not for the Tory leadership contest even. So, I mean, we've got to a stage where everybody, when it really matters, wants to have something proportional, and you've just got to accept the result. Before we move on, and, and all the talk will turn to who has won this, Isabel, just reflect, us for a minute, reflect for us for a minute on Nicola Sturgeon, the Sturgeon years, the Sturgeon era, the Sturgeon legacy. She has been a formidable political force here, has she not? She has, and she was underestimated. So I remember when she took over in 2014, people were saying she won't have the same rock star status as Alex Salmond. And then I remember so many of my colleagues being astonished when she sold out the Glasgow Hydro at one of her first rallies. And suddenly it became clear that not only did she have that same appeal, that actually she would appeal to some of the soft unionist voters who just voted no in the independence referendum, who then really liked these massive billboards all around Scotland with Nicola Sturgeon's face on them saying stronger voice for Scotland and turned to the SNP in the 2015 general election. Yeah, looking back actually to the, when you mentioned the Hydro, Isabel, I mean those, those days, I mean 14,000 people and it really was like a rock concert, Leslie. Um, the membership that swelled so mm. spectacularly 2014, 2015 after the independence referendum has been the subject of real controversy now because we've only just found out last week actually how many members there are, the controversy surrounding the the party's attempt, shall we say, to perhaps guard that more tightly than they should have and, and leaking out information that wasn't entirely correct, uh, have seen the chief executive go, the head of communications go. What's the state of the SNP at the moment? Well, internally, there's been a lot of difficulty with just uh, an attempt to top-down control practically everything. That's to manage conference agendas so that, you know, motions that came in from lots of different branches just somehow never got onto the order paper. <clears throat> there was an entire slate, a sort of rejuvenation slate, if you like, uh, elected about four or five years ago, uh, one of whom uh, was Douglas Chapman, who was elected as national treasurer, tried to get in to see the books, couldn't see the books, resigned again. Now, 
that's never taken anyone's attention very much till now, but it's been growing, growing, growing. And local branches essentially being told what candidates to have. There's been resentment with that. So actually, there's hardly a bit of the SNP that hasn't been annoyed with something that the leadership has done over these years. And important to frame this, I think, for viewers outside Scotland, to, to, to remind people that actually the SNP is not the independence movement. It is a part of the independence movement, right? Yeah. The independence movement is effectively a leaderless movement that does not have to buy into everything that the SNP does. Well, Would that be fair? It, it, probably. I mean, you're, we're, we're probably a sort of carnaptious bunch, and that's one for the, t for the, uh, for the Google search. But, uh, yeah, we're a distributed movement, if you want. I mean, there's lots of kind of leaders within it, but there's not one sitting overarching leadership. And that's partly because it's hard to keep everyone walking up the hill when it's a 10-year walk. And it's been 10 years, really, pretty much, since the first independence referendum. We're always told there's another referendum around the corner, next year, next year, next year. Yes, groups across Scotland have kept the faith, kept organising, but been invisible. And now probably the Yes movement needs to decide it has to come forward and get organised because you can't allow a cause like independence to rise and fall with the necessary changes that happen in the electoral cycle. Uh, do you get a sense, Isabel, that, that um, or just put into context for us the difference between these two candidates and the crossroads that, that the SNP is at as a party now? Yeah, so Humza Yousaf is pitched as the, the continuity candidate. I know Leslie's got a, a slightly different view on who is the continuity candidate in terms of the way they conduct themselves. But he's obviously uh, very much tied himself to Nicola Sturgeon to the extent that he was saying that he would have the outgoing first minister on speed dial. Um, he does not have brilliant approval ratings, it has to be said, as health secretary. I think they were minus 16 with health chiefs warning that the health service was about to fall over. Kate Forbes has positioned herself as the change candidate, has, I think, shocked quite a lot of people during the contest with two things. One, her conservative views and her outspokenness on those, and the other, her readiness to criticise pretty much everything the Scottish Government has done up to this point, particularly if it involves Humza Yousaf. And then we have Ash Reagan, who's seen as the outsider, uh, who was little known until she resigned from the Government, as I think it was Community Safety Minister, over the Gender Recognition Reform Bill, which is one of the things that has caused real rancour recently and in this contest. Right. Right, we're watching pictures of the podium at Murrayfield now. We're waiting for Lorna Finn, the National Secretary of the SNP, who has, who has run this election process and will be the uh, returning officer, effectively, this afternoon to come on stage. We'll cut to that as soon as she does. John Curtis, just going back to what Isabel was saying there then, mm -hmm. um, Kate Forbes seems to be potentially more popular with the country at large, less yes. popular with the party establishment, vice versa, Humza Yusuf. Yes. So we could be in a situation where the party establishment... Oh, hang on, here is Lorna Finn, the National Secretary of the SNP, with the result. The National Secretary of the SNP with the result. The We're looking at the candidates just taking their seats there, and here comes Lorna Finn now. Good afternoon and welcome to Murrayfield. My name is Kirsten Oswald and I am the SNP business convener. And I'm delighted to be here today at the culmination of this election contest to choose our new SNP leader. The contest has taken our three candidates the length and breadth of Scotland. They've beamed into our living rooms via TV debates and they've worked tirelessly to engage with members all over the country. So this is a historic moment for the SNP. And as we look forward to our new leader, I want to thank Nicola Sturgeon for her exceptional leadership over the past eight and a half years. I'd also like to convey my thanks to the candidates, to our members, and to everyone at SNP HQ and our National Executive Committee who've worked so hard behind the scenes to deliver this important exercise in party democracy. And I'm delighted to welcome to the stage to announce our new leader, Lorna Finn, SNP <coughs> National Secretary. As National Secretary of the SNP, I have been given the results of the party leader election 2023 from my voice, the Ballot Services Company. These are as follows. The final number of eligible members was 72,169. A total of 50,494 ballot papers containing a valid vote were received. There were three rejected postal ballot papers. The turnout was therefore 70%. 
48,645 of the ballots were cast electronically and 1,849 of the ballots were cast by post. The first preference votes are as follows. Ash Reagan, 5,599. This represents 11.1% of the first preference vote. Kate Forbes, 20,559. This represents 48.7% of the first preference vote. Hamza Youssef, 24,336. This represents 48.2% of the first preference vote. As no candidate received more than 50% of the votes, Ash Reagan, as the candidate who received the least number of first preferences, was eliminated, and the second preference votes in favour of Kate Forbes or Hamza Youssef were given to them. The result after those votes were redistributed was as follows. Kate Forbes, 23,890. This represents 47.9% of the final vote. Hamza Youssef, 26,032. This represents 52.1% of the final vote. I therefore declare Hamza Youssef duly elected as the Scottish National Party leader. Congratulations, Hamza. And I now invite you up to say a few words. Hamza Yusuf, the son of two first-generation immigrants from Pakistan, who's worked his way right up through the ranks of this party to the very top. Once the formalities of the next couple of days are taken care of, he will become Scotland's sixth first minister. As we were saying earlier on, the party establishment's favourite candidate, our favourite candidate in this election process, and he has won. Let's hear from him now. Can I begin by thanking our National Secretary, Lorna Finn, and also can I thank our headquarters staff for all the incredible efforts that they have made right throughout this process. It is hard for me to find the words to describe just how honoured I am to be entrusted by our membership of the SNP to be the party's next leader and to be on the cusp of being our country's next First Minister. Can I begin by paying tribute to my colleagues, uh, both Kate and Ash. During almost 20 hustings, it's probably felt like we've seen each other more than we have our respective families. You both have put in an incredible shift, and I know that collectively we will continue to work hard as part of Team SNP. Uh, I am not just humbled of that, I most certainly am. I also feel like the luckiest man in the world to be standing here as the leader of the SNP, a party I joined almost 20 years ago and that I love so dearly. Friends, it was the late John Smith, and he got it absolutely right when he said, the opportunity to serve our country is all we ask. To serve my country as First Minister will be the greatest privilege and honour of my life, should Parliament decide to elect me as Scotland's next First Minister tomorrow. And just as I will lead the SNP in the interests of all party members, not just those who voted for me, so I will aim to lead Scotland in the interests of all of our citizens, whatever your political allegiance. If elected as your First Minister after tomorrow's vote in Parliament, know that I will be a First Minister for all of Scotland, that I will work every minute of every day to earn and to re-earn your respect and your trust. I will do that by treating you, the people of Scotland, with respect. There will be no empty promises or easy sound bites when the issues in front of us are difficult and complex, because government is not easy, and I won't pretend that it is. My immediate priority will be to continue to protect every Scot as far as we possibly can from the harm inflicted by the cost of living crisis, to recover and reform our NHS and other vital public services, to support our wellbeing economy, to improve the life chances of people right across this country. 
I will move quickly to develop plans to extend childcare, to improve rural housing, support small businesses and boost innovation. I will bring forward reforms of the criminal justice system. I will work with local government to empower our local authorities. And as First Minister, I will not shy away from those exceptionally tough challenges that require the difficult decisions. But where this challenge, I will use it to also find opportunity. My government will seize the economic and social opportunity that the journey to net zero will bring. A country as energy rich as Scotland should not have people living in fuel poverty. The government I lead will renew and redouble our efforts to lift people out of poverty, to make work fair, to make our economy work for the people, and to ensure as we become a more prosperous country, we also become a fairer country too. And while I have had my fair share of battles with the UK government over the years, and there may well be some to come, I will work with them and other devolved nations constructively where I can in the best interests of our nation. I'm a proud Scot, and equally a proud European too. And Scotland is a European nation. We want to return to the European Union and play our part in building a continent that's based on human rights, on peace, prosperity, and social justice. To the people of Scotland, the SNP has earned your trust by governing well, by ensuring that your priorities are our priorities. As a party and as a government, we are at our best when we are radical and bold. And the challenges we face today, they require nothing less of us. That is what I promise the people of Scotland, if Parliament, of course, puts its trust in me tomorrow. Joining the SNP for me was an act of hope, but it was also a statement of intent. I was determined then, as I am now, that we will deliver independence for Scotland together as a team. Leadership elections, by their very nature, can be bruising. However, in the SNP, we are a family. Over the last five weeks, we may have been competitors or supporters of different candidates. We are no longer Team Hamza or Team Ash or Team Kate. We are one team and we will be the team. We will be the generation that delivers independence for Scotland. Where there are divisions to heal, we must do so quickly because we have a job to do. As a party, we are at our strongest when we are united. And what unites us is our shared goal of delivering independence <coughs> for our nation. To those in Scotland who don't yet quite share that passion that I do for independence, I will aim to earn your trust by continuing to ensure we govern well and earn your respect as First Minister by focusing on the priorities that matter to all of us. And in doing so, using our devolved powers to the absolute maximum effect to tackle the challenges of the day. And for those of us in this room and watching who do believe in independence, <coughs> we will only win by making that case on the doorsteps. And my solemn promise and commitment to you is that I will kickstart our grassroots, our civic-led movement and ensure our drive for independence is in fifth gear. The people of Scotland need independence now more than ever before, and we will be the generation that delivers independence for Scotland. Before concluding, I want to take the opportunity to thank some very, very special people indeed, and I wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for the support and the encouragement of a number of hardworking people. First of all, there is my amazing wife, Nadia. Uh, she is not just my rock, she is my compass, who helps to guide me through the most difficult times uh, in life. There, were, there is no way, not a chance in hell, that I would be standing here if it was not for your love, uh, for your support, and for your advice. Thank you for believing in me uh, and for always being there for me. I will love you uh, more, and I do love you more than, words, uh, more than the words uh, that I can find to express. To my girls, the, <laughs> this job uh, will at times be all-consuming, I suspect, uh, but know that there is no more uh, important job in my life than being your dad. Uh, to Maya and Amal, you will always, always uh, come first. To my mum, to my dad, to my sisters, thank you for your unwavering support throughout my life, for picking me up 
when I have been down and for telling me to keep going when at times I had my doubts. I'd also like to thank my phenomenal campaign team. You have worked day and night over the last few weeks to support me. You've all sacrificed time with your family and your friends because, like me, you believe in our vision of a progressively, uh, progressive, socially just Scotland. And I will not let you down. A special mention to Neil Gray. Uh, he is quite simply the best corner man I could have asked for. During the roller coaster of emotion that is any leadership contest, you have been by my side, uh, and there is no way I would have made it to the finish line without your support. And to my good friend uh, and colleague, Shona Robison, your wise counsel has been indispensable to me during this contest. To our now former uh, leader, Nicola Sturgeon, and her deputy in government, John Swinney, thank you for your dedicated service to this party, to our country, and to all the people of Scotland. You have left me strong foundations to build upon. And thank you to my colleagues in both parliaments, across local government, and activists around the country who have been so supportive and so encouraging. I will, sure that I har and I will ensure that I harness all of the talent across the party and across the country as I build that team that will take Scotland forward to deliver our nation's independence. From our brilliant MPs, led ably by Stephen Flynn uh, and by Mary Black in Westminster, to our leaders in local government, as well as our exceptional group of MSPs in the Scottish Parliament, our Parliament has an array of talent right through its ranks. Our parliamentarians, our councillors, our activists, our members all have a vital part to play on our journey to independence, as do our friends right across the independence movement. To have your confidence as I take on the role as SNP leader means so much to me. My final thanks is to my grandparents. Unfortunately, they're no longer alive to see this day, but I'm forever, I'm forever thankful that my grandparents made the trip from Punjab to Scotland over 60 years ago. As immigrants to this country who knew barely a word of English, they could not have imagined in their wildest dreams that their grandson would one day be on the cusp of being the next First Minister of Scotland. As Mohammed Yusuf worked in the Singer sewing machine factory in Clyde Bank, as Rahmat Ali Bhutta stamped tickets on the Glasgow Corporation buses, they could not have imagined, as I say in their wildest dreams, that two generations later, that their grandson would one day be on the cusp of being Scotland's First Minister. We should all take pride in the fact that today we have sent a clear message that your colour of skin, or indeed your faith, is not a barrier to leading the country that we all call home. From the Punjab to our parliament, this is a journey over generations that reminds us we should be celebrating and always celebrate the migrants who contribute so much to our country. This is what drives my commitment to equality that will underpin my actions as First Minister. Thank you for the honour of choosing me to be your nominee to become, to become Scotland's sixth First Minister. I will dedicate every waking moment to serving you, the people of Scotland. Thank you very much. Taking the applause at Murrayfield, he will, barring some unforeseeable drama in Holyrood tomorrow, be voted much. in as Scotland's first minister and sworn in at the court of session the following day. He is going to take a couple of questions. Shall we have a listen? Questions here from the press. BBC Jim Cook. No, we're not going to take those questions quite yet. Hopefully, we will come back to that. Uh, right, loads to discuss. Isabel, first, your reaction. It was tight. Yeah, it was tight and it was, uh, you could see actually just in the emotion on Kate Forbes and Humza Yousaf's faces as they sat down before the result was announced to everyone else that they hadn't known how this was going to go either. They were obviously told the result a few minutes beforehand but clearly they were processing something that had come as a bit of a surprise to both of them. Um, I think in terms of the Westminster reaction to this, I think there's going to be quite a bit of relief um, from the unionist parties that someone who they feel they can characterise as, as, as being poor at government has, has taken over as First Minister. They were much more anxious about 
Kate Forbes. I think within the SNP movement, uh, there's probably quite a lot of relief that this isn't going to cause a big split over uh, over individual moral issues, which was what was threatened by Kate Forbes. Uh, Leslie, what do winning. you what do you make of that, and and what do you make of the broader result? Well. I mean, that, that speech did a lot for me as an independent supporter. Um, that it, it hit an awful lot of the right buttons. Independence it, was a long way down his, his list of priorities. Yeah, though. but it's the whole take. I mean, the, the point that he was making, it sounded very much like the moment that Nicola Sturgeon reached out to Europeans after the Brexit vote and said, you know, you'll always be welcome here. That's the kind of Scotland we do. We don't do the kind of stuff you get down the road. We're different. And that differentness was basically the hallmark of most of that speech there. He reached across, I think, quite cleverly to take a quote from John Smith. He's very much from that uh, part of the party that is essentially social democratic, is looking to keep that Labour-leaning vote on board. Uh, it would have been quite different under Kate Forbes, and clearly we would now be sitting discussing whether the Greens were even going to stay in government. Now, they're going to have to do an awful lot better at selling some of the ideas that have just gone through because they have the majority. Don't think they've worked hard enough. He's had his collar felt in a big way there by that result. So there's got to be boldness and there's got to be more sort of liveliness about pushing ideas forward from, from Humza. Yeah, that, that, that is interesting, actually, the settled nature of government now as opposed to the disruption that Kate Forbes would have, would have caused had she won. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second. John Curtis, though, let's, let's crunch some numbers. Uh, one stat that kind of got lost in a bit of that, turnout 70%. Yes. What does that tell you? Well, I mean, the truth is, I, you never get every member uh, a participating election. You didn't get every member uh, voting in the Tory leadership uh, contest of last year. So I don't think it's too much to be made of that. Um, I think I think there are two things to say about this result. One is that it will mean, in the short term at least, that the nationalist ship, which has you know had a bit of a battering, will uh, uh, come to a somewhat uh, calmer position. And in particular, not least, because if Kate Forbes had won, then you know, a, lot of, a lot of SNP parliamentarians would have been rather unhappy. But given the strength of Mr Yusuf's support within the two parliamentary parties, one has to say that only getting 52% of the vote after the redistribution was a rather narrow result. So I think while in the short term he will bring his party together and he will be able to form an administration with ease, I suspect he's going to have to offer Ms Forbes a position, a senior position in the cabinet, perhaps remaining as, as finance secretary. Whether or not she decides to take it, that might be another matter. And I think probably in a few months' time, parliamentarians will be looking to see whether Mr Yusuf has indeed begun to develop an ability to reach out to the wider Scottish public to get SNP support back up to closer to the 50% support rather than the 40% it is at the moment and to be fending off Labour's challenge. So I think things come for a while but this is a leader whose authority within his party is still, to some degree, going to have to be out. Yeah, it's interesting. We're looking at the, at the final figures there. You, it's a privilege to be sitting beside somebody with as gymnastic a brain as yours. Just as we were totting up the second round, I heard you muttering as you were jotting it down, he's won. Just at the moment, I was thinking, she's won. So that'll <laughs> teach me. Glad you've got the microphone and not me. Um, uh, Leslie Riddick, let's just... Put, pause for a moment and think about the, the, the tail end of Humza Yusuf's speech there where he was talking about his grandparents coming over, a sewing machine factory worker, a bus conductor, um, and, and where we are as a country as well. Scotland is about to get its first Muslim first minister at, at a time when the UK as a whole has a Hindu prime minister. It's a moment worth Think worth consideration, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, that's a tremendous strength, actually, across across the parliaments, that uh, the, the ethnic minorities are not in any way seen as, as some sort of difficulty in terms of election and, uh, and winning elections. And that's part of, you know, the, the mixed mongrel nation, if you like, that Scotland conceives itself to be. So that's a kind of really positive point. But I think the way that uh, Humza tried to articulate that about this equality, larger equality issue, he drew from his own experience of, of racism in Scotland and the need to protect himself as a minority. Uh, the, the larger issues that they got into about gay marriage and equal rights in a more general way. Yeah. Um, I was saying to Leslie as well that, that independence came quite a long way down, his list of priorities. I mean, I'm just looking through here. We went through cost of living crisis, NHS, childcare, rural housing, the journey to net zero, all of that before we came to it. Are you reading anything into that or is, is that just how he's he's chosen to frame it for a wider audience? I mean, I think there are two things. One is that independence does, as I said earlier, seem quite a lot further away at the moment. The other is that to get 
soft unionist, soft indie voters to, to come over to the independence cause, as he said, the SNP has to appeal to them and to appear to be talking constantly about the constitution when there is a cost of living crisis would not be politically savvy so he is right to say what well, you know we've got these domestic challenges to deal with in terms of scotland having poverty while being an energy rich uh, country is, is really important and it's something that the the opposition parties are, are, are really hammering uh, the snp on at the moment and well, i think so. it's worth bearing in mind martin anybody yep. who's ever listened to snp conference speeches by leaders the bit about independence always comes at the end because the point is that's the issue that brings the party together. It's the bit around you where you can construct a peroration. I mean, if there was any departure, it was not that independence came after the more difficult issues. It was then the bit at the end, the yeah. very personal bit about his background. And in a sense, I think for me at least, that was the bit that above all. And perhaps people, irrespective of their views about politics, perhaps found the most moving and most personal. I mean, fin finish with a bit you want to leave people thinking about. Yeah, yeah, there's a very, very clear logic in that. Right, let's get some reaction then from uh, opposition parties in Scotland. We can go to uh, Glasgow now and speak to Anas Sarwar, I think, a leader of Scottish Labour. There he is. G good afternoon, Mr Sarwar. Thanks very much for being with us. Your reaction? Thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Look, I think the first thing to see is, regardless of our uh, politics and regardless of how I may question Hamza Yusuf's mandate or indeed the SNP record, I think it's important to pause for a moment and reflect on the significance of the election of what will likely become the first minister from the first first minister from an ethnic minority background. I think that is a significant moment for Scotland. So a sincere congratulations to Hamza Yusuf, a sincere congratulations to uh, his family. Uh, and I know that moment won't be lost on particularly our South Asian community here in Scotland. Yeah, he is uh, an old pal of yours. I know you've campaigned together against racism up here. Uh, you went to the same school. You go back a long way. No more Mr. Nice Guy, though. I presume you'll be facing him now in Parliament. Look, as I say, I, I question his mandate, I question his record, but I still uh, congratulate him on the significance of today. But let's be honest, we have a twin crisis here in Scotland, the economic crisis that's led to a cost of living crisis, an NHS crisis with record long waiting lists presided over by Hamza Youssef as our health secretary. And I think at this time of crises, it, we need someone with competence, with ability and with new ideas and new energy. And frankly, I don't believe the SNP now provide that for us. And therefore, uh, I think the mandate is in question. I think the new leader does, of course, inherit Nicola Sturgeon's record, but they don't inherit Nicola Sturgeon's mandate. That was an election that was very much a pandemic election where Nicola Sturgeon it made a direct appeal to people to say, let me lead you through the rest of this pandemic. Let me lead you through the recovery. That recovery hasn't even started yet. And Nicola Sturgeon now vacated the field. And I don't think Hamza Youssef is up to the task, to be frank, of the big challenge now facing Scotland. Yeah, I mean, you say there isn't a mandate. Your, your party switched leaders while in government, did it not? Well, let's look at what was said in the past. Look, I'm, I'm not going to answer for what happened when I was a teenager, but John Swinney made it very clear uh, when we changed First Minister that this was, in his words, uh, an arrogant approach, uh, a behind-closed-door deal, uh, arrogant in power, and frankly, that Scotland deserved better. Nicola Sturgeon said, like we did, uh, that Rishi Sunak should go to the country because he didn't have a mandate to govern as a new Prime Minister. So I'm holding them to their own uh, measure and test. And I think, frankly, in the twin crisis that we have and the huge challenges facing our country, those issues have to be the priority, not just a party talking to itself about itself. People for a long time talked about the Labour Party being in chaos and division. That's now the uh, premise of the SNP right now, and I think that lets Scots down. That lets Scots down. All right. And that's our uh, Scottish Labour leader. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Another party who has changed leaders whilst in government more than once in the recent past, the Conservatives. Their Scottish leader, Douglas Ross, joins me now. Good afternoon, Mr Ross. Good afternoon, uh, Your reaction? Well, I want to congratulate Hamza Youssef uh, on his victory, the first uh, SNP leader from an ethnic minority background, the first Muslim leader uh, of the SNP. You could hear uh, in his speech the importance it is for, for him personally and his family. Uh, there was a touching moment when the camera went to his mum and she, she dabbed away uh, a tear. So a very proud moment for, for him personally and his family. Uh, but now the onus is on getting down to work and focusing on the issues that really matter to people across Scotland. And that is the cost of living crisis. It's about getting the NHS back up and running again because it has been struggling for many, many years uh, and Hamza Youssef has been in charge of the NHS during that period. Well, he put that right near the top of his list of priorities. Uh, nonetheless, he will become First Minister tomorrow. There is a process to be gone through. Um, 
you will stand against him, will you? Yes, yes I will. That's a process that we've had. Uh, I think every time there's been a change of leader of the biggest party, uh, that certainly the leader of the opposition stands against them. Uh, I got 31 votes last time. I'm expecting about the same this time. In a funny way, it might be more difficult for him if uh, you didn't stand against him, just in the way that the system works. In yeah, it's, it's a very strange uh, system that we have here for electing First Minister. I think we might have been having more of a, an interesting conversation if Kate Forbes had been successful. We knew from your interview at the weekend uh, that the Greens were not wholly on board with what she was proposing. Uh, but with Hamza Youssef, he's been very clear during this campaign that he wants to keep the Greens in government. I've got serious concerns about that. A party that are anti-growth being at the heart of the Scottish Government is not good for Scotland's economy and we need to get Scotland's economy moving again. You had a difficult, um, fractious relationship with Nicola Sturgeon. That was evident right to the very end. First Minister's questions last week was a fairly ill-tempered affair. Are you hoping a reset might be possible now? Well, look, I'm going to approach this as constructively as I can. I've worked with Hamza Youssef on local issues. Our Murray Maternity Services has been a big campaign that I've been dealing with as a, an MP and an MSP and I've worked closely uh, with Hamza Youssef in his role as Health Secretary. So I will work with him and his government uh, if they are going to bring forward the right approaches for the people across Scotland. But we've seen in health, in justice and in transport that actually he's had major difficulties because of his own personal feelings and we have to see improvement because these are the issues that really matter to people. All right, Douglas Ross, leader of the Scottish Conservatives, many thanks indeed. Right, so we are uh, Hamza Youssef will, uh, barring some unforeseen event, become First Minister tomorrow. Let's have a look uh, a, a bit more closely at the man and his background. Here with a profile of Hamza Youssef is Kirsten Campbell. Nicola Sturgeon had the measure of Hamza Youssef from the earliest days of his political career. He was tipped as one to watch from the moment he was first elected 12 years ago. Hamza Youssef, Glasgow. Mayor Hamza Youssef. At 37, he'll be Scotland's youngest First Minister and the first Scots Asian to hold the role. He's the son of immigrants who came to Scotland in the 1960s and friends say that's given him compassion for others. An 18-year-old, Hamza Yusuf, walks into the charity shop. I want to volunteer. I said, yeah, join, join, welcome. And start cleaning the floor, go and clean the toilet. That's where I, I want to test him and he did it. And then the former head of the humanitarian agency Islamic Relief remembers him fondly. Looking back now, I never thought he'd become a, pol uh, a politician because he, I, I still see him as a truly humanitarian because he has a very soft heart and he used to get very emotional, you know, very emotional, especially when uh, time of disasters. <laughs> It was the Iraq war that inspired Hamza Youssef to join the SNP when he was a student at Glasgow University. He'd come to the conclusion that only independence would stop Scotland being dragged into an illegal conflict. Friends from the time say he's always served those who are less fortunate. He's a people person at heart, you know. Uh, he cares about what he does and for the country. And I think that's what drives him, you know. Um, he's affable, he's dependable. Um, and I think, I think that comes through in what he does in, in, in the public eye. Hamza Youssef has spoken about being a victim of racism and he and his wife have sought to challenge discrimination when they've come up against it. He retains a passion to help those in need, here assisting Syrian refugees ashore in Greece when he was International Development Minister. Having witnessed what I've witnessed today, uh, thousands of people arriving in the island of Lesbos for a better life in Europe, sacrificing everything and risking their own lives and their children's lives. I think it would be a real stain on our conscience if we didn't assist those people. He's a career politician seen as the continuity candidate, but during the leadership campaign, his record in government came under attack from his opponents. When he was transport minister, he was fined for driving without insurance. He had a spell as justice secretary too, while as health secretary, he may have avoided strike action in the NHS, but post-pandemic waiting lists are at an all-time high. Described as a son of the SNP, now it's Hamza Youssef's turn to lead. His challenge to reunite a divided party and to govern a divided nation. Kirsten Campbell, BBC News, Holyrood. Kirsten Campbell there with a profile of Hamza Youssef. Let's go down to Westminster once again now, shall we, and speak to the BBC's political editor, Chris Mason. Chris, ju just sum up your thoughts for us, if you would, in the context of the, of the size of the, the SNP representation at Westminster. 45 seats there. This is a... This is a party with a big chunk of power down there, so it's an important moment. 
Exactly that. Exactly that. And a, and a real moment, and a real moment of jeopardy. I know see, speaking to senior figures within the SNP this morning, there was a sense of apprehension, whichever side they were on, uh, as far as how this might turn out. And it was mighty close, wasn't it, as your discussion has been uh, reflecting. Now, for the SNP and the SNP's political opponents, a chance in the coming days to survey the new political landscape, the post-Sturgeon political landscape in Scotland, the implications that that has uh, at Holyrood and in Scottish politics, but then in wider UK politics here at Westminster. I think, as we've been hearing from uh, the political opponents of the SNP, there will be reflections, I suspect we'll get this from the Prime Minister shortly, of how big a moment it is that Scotland's in all likelihood soon to be First Minister is from a minority ethnic background, just as the Prime Minister is, just as the Mayor of London is. That says something and will be remarked upon significantly, I think, uh, about the UK in 2023. But then we will get to the raw politics. And the, the simple truth right now is that the SNP's principal political opponents see this as an opportunity, that the SNP have had two dominating figures back to back as leader. In comes someone clearly much less well known, particularly beyond Scotland. And for that reason, the SNP's political opponents think for them this might be a, a moment of opportunity. Of course, it'll be for the new SNP leadership to try and prove them wrong. But when plates shift in politics at moments like this, uh, people see, see opportunities to potentially uh, be seized. And that's what's going to make uh, uh, po Scottish politics and wider UK politics that bit more interesting as a result of uh, this contest. Chris Mason, thank you very much indeed. Let's turn our attention in the minutes we have left then to the great tectonic shift that the SNP want to create, independence. John Curtis, just sum up for us where we are at the moment with that, if you could. Well, if you take the average of the polls that have been done during the leadership contest, support for independence is averaging 47%. That's the lowest that it's been certainly for since 2019. We've been getting used to having opinion polls where support for yes has tended to be almost at the 50% mark, it has eased back a little. Um, but I think the important thing to, re to realise about, about all of this is that we are now looking at a very, very different independence debate from the one that we had back in 2014. Um, there was a lot of talk during 2014 about whether or not an independent Scotland could be a continuing member of the European Union, but frankly it was irrelevant. Voters weren't voting on the basis of the European Union. Now we're looking at an independence debate where the choice isn't simply about being inside or outside the UK. It's actually about being inside the UK but outside the European Union or outside the UK but inside at the European Union. And support for independence now in Scotland is three times higher amongst those people who want to be inside the European Union, which of course in Scotland is around two thirds of the public in Scotland, uh, than it is amongst those who want to be outside the European Union. And I think one of the uh, crucial challenges facing the new leader will be to get the debate about independence kick-started again, get it something people want, want to talk about, because that in the end was what Nicola Sturgeon was not able to do in the post-pandemic environment. How does he do that, Leslie Reddy? Well, that's going to be tough. I mean, the thing is, there's a general election coming up soon, and uh, whether or not it's going to be a de facto referendum, which it looks like it's not going to be now, since none of the candidates really favoured that. They've still got an election campaign, though, and it's not really credible to most of us who are independent supporters that it's just going to be one another of the normal elections. There's got to be a way of focusing this down on some of the issues, particularly independence, but also this post-Brexit situation. So there's got to be some energy put into that. I hear uh, also Humza saying he wants to restart the grassroots campaign. To be honest, that's not really for the SNP to do because they were never quite there. So there's going to have to be much closer working with the Yes okay. movement. Isabel Harman, finally, very briefly, do you write for The Spectator, unionist publication? Do you think independence is a more distant thought now than it was six weeks ago in 20 seconds? Yeah, I think it is, actually. And I think the unionist parties, both here in Holyrood and down in Westminster, are probably feeling quite relieved currently. All right. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Professor Sir John Curtis. And thank you for being with us here at Holyrood this afternoon. The SNP has a new leader uh, tomorrow. Scotland will have a new First Minister. It's sixth First Minister, Hamza Youssef. Uh, for him, the hard work starts now. For us, that's it for this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your day, whatever you've got planned. <laughs>